Juneau World Affairs Council presents the Democracy for All Amendment with Jeff Clements. Clements is the president of American Promise, a cross-partisan advocacy nonprofit seeking a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to limit money's influence on elections. Thank you so much. It's a treat to be here in Juneau. We've had such a lovely time with so many wonderful people and looking forward to going on to Anchorage and Fairbanks to bring this conversation and bring us together as Americans to this conversation about the state of our republic and the problem of undue influence and massive amounts of money coming into our political system. Uh, at American Promise, which we founded on January 1, 2016, we're bringing Americans together across partisan lines, across all lines that divide us to try to win a constitutional amendment that will enable us, the people, enable Alaska as a state and a people to decide how to best address the problem of unlimited money in our political system so that the people's voice is heard and that we can begin to solve so many big problems. So it all begins, of course, with here in Alaska, your Constitution, uh, Section 2 of the Constitution up here, reaffirms uh, that the power of government comes from the people and it is for the purpose of the people and the common good. And I, I was struck in reading that because, of course, your Constitution was written in the late 1950s as Alaska uh, began its um, initiation into statehood and became the 49th state. But that principle of the source of government power and the reason for government action coming from the people goes right back to my hometown in Concord, Massachusetts, 1775, when we uh, like to say in Concord, I've had this disputed when I go to Virginia and lots of other places in the country, but when we started the American Revolution uh, to decide, you know, we're going to really try this thing of a big republic that can govern itself with equal citizens. No kings, no queens, no dictators, just the people governing together. And that has been the challenge, of course, of the whole American experiment, is, is can that survive? No, no human society has succeeded, actually, in that kind of government for three centuries, as far as I've been able to discern. And uh, we are into our third century, of course, and facing some of the same kinds of stresses that so worried the founders of the Republic, worried the founders of the Alaskan Constitution, about how do you protect government of the people in a world of powerful, concentrated power, including concentrated wealth. And so that's what we're working on at American Promise. And I'm so grateful to share it with you at the World Affairs Council here in Juneau and all over Alaska. And um, thank you very much again. So our big uh, solution, if you will, that is now moving in a conversation around the country is this idea that we have a constitutional problem, that the Supreme Court has actually changed the principle about the source of political power or the source of free speech to money being free speech, whether it's corporations, unions, billionaires, wherever the money comes from, that that's free speech and unlimited money. I mean, unlimited money is free speech, and so therefore it's a free speech First Amendment violation to try to limit it. I'll say a little bit more about that, but that's why it's a constitutional issue, uh, because um, it's a Supreme Court interpretation of what the Constitution means that has led to so much of the money in our political system. Um, that's what, how we are looking at this problem. There are a lot of challenges globally, as you know, at the World Affairs Council for democracies around the world. Only 5% of the globe actually now lives under what the last uh, democracy index from The Economist defined as a functioning full democracy, less than 5%. Uh, one third of the globe lives under full authoritarian regimes. That's billions of people. Uh, democracies are now being downgraded, countries like Taiwan, Chile, and in the last index, the United States of America. And so this is a serious challenge to us, uh, but we think if we can get this right, uh, if we can empower citizens as citizens, check and balance some of the concentrated power of wealth, that's global wealth now, and having 
this destabilizing effects in our political system, we can begin to solve some of the other challenges that we have. And so that's the problem. Um, there's lots of ways to look at it. As I said, the Supreme Court helped open the floodgates and created this problem, I think inadvertently, and not all at once. I sometimes quote Hemingway and the joke about bankruptcy. It started gradually and then it was all at once. Um, and that's kind of what happened with our First Amendment and the Constitution. And in the late 70s and 80s, there's this beginnings of this idea that money is a free freedom of speech, spending money to influence elections, and therefore the people can't enact laws to limit it um, so that um, all of us have a voice or to combat corruption. And that became a, a um, increasingly strong doctrine uh, over these years with not in a clear, you know, liberal or conservative justice on one side or the other. Sometimes liberals were in the majority and conservative justices like William Rehnquist were in the dissent warning that if we empower corporations as speakers and money as speech in a way that we would for human beings, that that can have terrible effects on a republic. Uh, he was warning in his dissents, Justice Rehnquist was, about the kind of place that we've now ended up with a wash in money. And so, um, you know, we often hear about Citizens United, but my point is that was not the only case. This has been a long time coming, uh, and it's a constitutional doctrine that the people have not actually been a part of making. Uh, this didn't happen because we had a constitutional amendment that said, hey, let's have a system where we're not allowed to enact laws to limit the way money decides elections so that people, that never happened. It was a interpretation of the Supreme Court over the years. Uh, Jim Leach is former Republican congressman from Iowa for many years, um, and he's on our National Advisory Council at American Promise. And he warns that what the Supreme Court has done in these series of cases amounts to, in his words, a genetic modification of our democratic DNA pushing us towards corporatism and oligarchy. So wh what was the genetic modification? What does he mean by that? You know, he's from Iowa. There's big agriculture there. <laughs> There's issues around genetic modification and, and food systems. But what he means is, is the, the, what the Supreme Court did in, in, in these decisions was actually take certain principles, like taking stripping out DNA of the um, First Amendment and the Constitution, and the two big ones that the court decided no longer count in the balance when you're weighing the question of money versus free speech in our political system, they decided in these cases that our equal rights as citizens to be heard or to be represented is not a factor in the balance. Uh, so that if I went to the Supreme Court and I argued, well, the reason Alaska has a law that says there's limits on what outside money can do in your elections. Money from the lower 48 or around the world. There's, Alaskans have decided they want limits on that to protect the voice of the Alaskan people to decide who is going to represent them because they all have an equal right as Alaska citizens to be represented and to speak and debate and decide you know, how to vote and how to persuade others to vote. And they have an equal right to do that. And so if there's you know, millions of dollars pouring in from elsewhere, that will violate the equal rights to free speech that you all have. If I made that argument, we would lose for the sole reason that I'm making an argument the Supreme Court says that's not a relevant factor for deciding whether the Alaskan law violates free speech. If I said, well, it's because there's, you know, the Alaskan people are concerned about systemic corruption, that too much money will sort of shift gradually and subtly, and not because anybody individually is corrupt, but systemically, it'll shift the representation and the loyalties to the sources of the money, to the people who provide the money to the campaigns. That's why Alaskans want to make sure the money and the voices come from Alaskan people. Uh, that also would lose, because the court says, no, systemic corruption is not a reason to justify your laws about money and politics. The only reason that would justify it, the Supreme Court now says, is what they call quid pro quo corruption. That means what they say is a direct exchange of an official act 
for cash or money. And that's quid pro quo corruption, the Supreme Court says. So that you can still do. You can still have limits on direct contributions. You can still have bribery laws. But all those other reasons the Supreme Court says don't, they don't count anymore. And that's what Jim Leach is warning about. That is a genetic modification to our democratic DNA because it goes to the heart of the American political theory, the American constitutional theory, that we're equal citizens. We're not equal materially. We're not equal economically. We're not equal in lots of ways. And that's as it, as it is, as it, as it should be in a dynamic society. But fundamentally, all Americans are created equal. And in the political process, we have an equal right to free speech, an equal right to be heard, an equal right to be represented. And so by removing that, that's a big, big thing. And so it's not just constitutional theory, though. It has a, that systemic effect. So we now have, it says $40 billion. It's now closer to $50 billion in the last decade that have poured into elections. And here's the thing. It's not just the amount of money. It's the fact that most of that money comes from less than 1% of the American population. Most of the money comes from very few people. You could not find a more efficient way to shift political power from based on the people, as the Alaskan Constitution says, to based on wealth than deciding that the money is, can't be limited and will decide have the most effect on who wins and loses elections and who is then represented afterwards than that. And so it's that concentrated power that's always been a concern for any republic and that the founders of our republic certainly recognized. Now there is an argument that, well, incumbents have such advantage, therefore we need unlimited money in order to be able to challenge incumbents. We need to have, you know, billionaires or corporate money or union money so that we'll have comp competitive elections. And it turns out we've now been had this system of it getting worse and worse, but about 10 years of this, and it's clear that's not true. The election competitiveness is in free fall. 40% of legislative races nationwide are uncontested. There's nobody to choose from except one in 40% of legislative districts around the country. And so, and you can think about it intuitively, if the incumbents actually have the most advantage in raising money because they control the policy and what they can do in exchange for the money. Somebody like anyone in this room or anyone around Alaska who wanted to run for office, want to run for the Senate? Well, your 2014 election for this US Senate, $40 million was spent in that election on both sides, $40 million. That's going to be pretty intimidating if you're going to want to run for office and you're looking at that kind of money. So it turns out you're not getting competitive elections. So nobody really likes this system. We never decided we wanted all this money in our election. Nobody likes it. Uh, you know, your Alaska Public Offices Commission is now defending a, um, a lawsuit because in recent years, the Alaska Public Offices Commission uh, which is in charge of enforcing your laws around limits on how money is used in the political system, um, has decided it can't actually enforce the laws that you wanted. So you had a law that said there's limits on how much money from one source can go into a PAC, you know, PAC contribution limits, political action committee. Well, the Supreme Court's case law says that is an independent expenditure, as the, as the phrase is. It's not a direct campaign contribution, therefore it's, and it's free speech, so it doesn't matter where it comes from, it, you can't limit that. So the Alaska Public Offices Commission said under this, these cases, we aren't able to enforce the law of Alaska, even though we want to. Uh, they said we, the commission would enforce limits on contributions to independent expenditure groups if it could, but it doesn't feel like it can. And you know, th you've lost another law, the one I mentioned about outside spending. You had limits on money from outside Alaska influencing state elections. Your fine judge in the US District Court, Judge Burgess, um, reviewed a challenge to that law and decided it was constitutional, that there, wasn't, there were good reasons. He heard the evidence. He heard the concern about corruption. He heard the concern about a big state with lots of resources and a relatively small population being at risk 
of outside money kind of controlling the state and taking it, the destiny of Alaska out of the hands of its citizens. And that's why you had the law. But it went up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, who used this new Supreme Court doctrine to say, well, we don't like it much either, but it can't stand. And so that law is off the books now in Alaska. Like many states, Alaska had rules about trying to limit the money from big corporations in elections. Big corporations are, are fine. Corporations are part of our economy. They're good tools. Um, they, they're a very useful aspect of economic life. But they're not political actors. They're not citizens. And so most, many states had laws limiting the amount of corporate money in elections because of that risk of it could overwhelm the voice of the citizens and get really some special favors that would be a concern. And many business leaders supported that. They, they don't want to be political entities either. Um, and so that law was wiped off the books by a case that came out of Montana uh, in recent years. Montana was one of the cases, like Alaska, concerned about big states, small population, rich in minerals, and they had a history of being dominated by big copper mine companies until they stepped up with a popular initiative, a ballot, citizen initiative, to get a law limiting corporate money. And that, they did that in 1912. And for 100 years, they had that law. And the First Amendment never changed in that 100 years. Freedom of speech never changed. But and suddenly, 100 years later, that law is unconstitutional and off the books. And, and so your law, to that effect, is also off the books now. So that's why we need a constitutional amendment. It's not because I'm here from Boston to say, I have a great idea. You should be doing it this way, not the way you're doing it. It's because everywhere I go, Americans all over the land want to be able to do what we're supposed to be able to do, which is decide our own destiny as a people with our fellow citizens. We might not agree with each other, but we respect our equal rights as citizens. And we should be making the rules about ensuring that we have fair and free elections and accountable representatives. And this is about putting the power back in your hands in Alaska to decide how you want to do it. Maybe you want that law about money from outside. Maybe you want that law about limits on PACs. Maybe you want that law about having corporations be in the economy, but not in the, every election. You should decide that. And that's what a constitutional amendment that we are working on will allow you to do. And it's a constitutional problem, as I said, not just we can't just go pass a law because the Supreme Court has said those laws, under the way they now interpret the Constitution, are unconstitutional. So this is, I hasten to say, nonpartisan, but also cross-partisan. And I want to explain that uh, nuance, because cross-partisan means it's OK to have different views. It's OK to have different parties. It's OK to compete and have and argue with our fellow citizens about partisan issues. It's great if we can do it respectfully and all that, but we can also come together to do things for the good of the country, for the state, for our communities, and we do that all the time. And this is a place where we can come together because Americans across the political spectrum support this. That's Al Simpson, I'm showing on the board here. He's a former senator, another Republican from Wyoming, um, who really puts it crisply that, you know, this is the number one problem, money in our elections, the dominance of money in our politics, because it's the one that prevents us from solving any other problem, whether it's $22 trillion in debt or opioid crisis or many other problems. I won't presume to say what Alaska's issues are. You know them far better than I do. But I think everywhere people have a sense we're having trouble solving our problems because the elections have been disconnected from the needs of the people because of the dominance of money. Olympia Snow, another Republican, former senator from Maine, also on our advisory council, um, strongly working in, in favor of this constitutional amendment. Again, this is about free speech. We are supporting free speech. It's about free speech for all Americans, not just free speech based on money. And that's her point when she says that the way we're doing it now, only those well-funded people, only those people with access to significant money are able to dominate the microphone and drown out other voices. So I said all Americans, very many Americans, obviously not all, we're Americans. We're going to disagree. We're going to argue. We're going to try to figure it out and have different views. But on this issue, there's remarkable consensus year after year after year. 
This is um, polls from 2011 through now, and it rarely goes below 70%, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or Independent, support for this constitutional amendment to give us the power to try to get a handle on money in our elections. And it's not just in the polls. We see it um, across uh, when people get a chance to vote on this amendment, as I'll say more about and how they do, but um, it usually is well over 75% support. Again, in different communities, doesn't matter the politics of a particular community. And I mentioned the business. Um, business executives actually don't much like this system either, even though supposedly it empowers corporations. Uh, the co-founder of, of American Promise, my friend and chair of our board, John Wass, uh, helped build Staples. When he started, it had two stores, two office supply stores, and of course it went to have thousands. And he's done, built three other companies since then. He sold his last one to Cardinal Health. He now has a new company that is about um, working with global CEOs, about increasing profitability at corpor of corporations. He knows business. And he is deeply concerned about not just democracy, but the relationship of the money problem on democracy and on the free enterprise system. And so this is something that business executives actually recognize. They don't want to do business in a way here in America like they see around the world, whether it's Russia or Saudi Arabia or many other countries where they don't have that dynamic, free um, democracy kind of system and you have to pay somebody, or you have to get political power, or you could find your business wiped out because some well-connected, well-paid, paying off business in the political system changed the rule or changed the regulations, so suddenly your whole business model is underwater. So you can see 89% of business executives want reasonable limits on how money is used in our political system. So what would the amendment say? Well. There are different versions that have already been introduced in Congress. There's a debate about what the exact words are, uh, should be. But I put this language up because it was recently introduced. We worked with Congressman Ted Deutsch and Congressman John Katko, and I think it's so significant because this doesn't happen very much. We're a Democrat anymore. It should happen more, but it doesn't. A Democrat and a Republican stand up together to be lead co-sponsors on something big to help get it done. And they have stood up to introduce this constitutional amendment language that is, is very significant. Even though it's short language, it's brief words, that's what the Constitution is about. Free speech, due process, equal protection, right to vote. Simple words, big, big meaning. And so the amendment says, the proposed amendment, to advance democratic self-government and political equality, equality, and to protect the integrity of government and the electoral process, Congress and the states may regulate and set reasonable limits on the raising and spending of money by candidates and others to influence elections. And in doing so, con Congress and the states may distinguish between natural persons and corporations or other artificial entities created by law, including by prohibiting such entities from spending money to influence elections. A couple of key things. Pol remember the de genetic modification, political equality stripped out, integrity of government or systemic corruption stripped out of the Constitution. This puts those concepts back in to secure political equality. That's our equal rights as citizens, to protect the integrity of our government and election process. That's the anti-corruption that the court doesn't recognize right now. Those are big concepts. And the other key thing is, this gives power to you in Alaska to decide what the rules are. This is not enacting some complex big law that will tell you exactly where you have to spend your money in elections and who you have to report to or anything like that. This gives you the power to decide once again that what kind of laws you want and that work here in Alaska for you to ensure you have a political system that satisfies that wonderful um, constitutional precept that you have that the political power belongs to the people and is for to serve the people. So that's what this amendment does and how you decide to implement it in Alaska will be different than in, we do in Massachusetts or someone does in Texas and that's what the American Republican system of government's all about is let's, let's give power back to the people to actually protect our integrity of elections and governmental system and we'll come up with lots of good effective 
solutions. There's already many out there. Um, so how do we do it? If that's the amendment, if we need an amendment to fix this problem, how do we pass it? It's daunting. Uh, I, won't, I won't kid you. This, this isn't something that any of us wave a wand and it happens. But that's also the challenge. The ch that challenge is also the, the beauty of it because it means that we have to come together as a country to do it. That creates a very positive reinforcing loop of, of, of sort of resolving again as a nation together for something big that's forever, a permanent structural reform. So we need two-thirds of Congress under Article 5 of the Constitution. Two-thirds of Congress propose the amendment. It then gets ratified in three-quarters of the states. Um, and so that's 38 states have to ratify it. Two-thirds of Congress is 67 senators have to vote for it. And 290 House members have to vote for it. And I know what you're thinking. Right? When's the last time 290 House members agreed across partisan lines on anything, or 67 senators? How are we going to do this? You may be skeptical. I was too. Um, I was a lawyer for close to three decades. Uh, <laughs> and the way I thought, the way I'd been taught in law school, the way I learned in practice is, well, how is the Constitution protected and, and defended and secured? Well, of course, lawyers, right? and judges and law professors and those experts and it turns out that's wrong you know that uh, it's not all Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a young attorney marching <laughs> up the Supreme Court steps to make the great argument that's gonna you know save the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause so that we're all equal it turns out I learned uh, that it's the people who have always protected and saved the Constitution often when the Supreme Court gets it tragically wrong. And so you think of the people actually being the founders of the Constitution in many ways. Sure, James Madison and the Convention of Philadelphia, absolutely a, a human miracle that that came out. But there's so much more work to do. And every generation, the American people have been completing that work from women voting to electing our senators to uh, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds voting, to ending slavery, so many of the things, the Bill of Rights, you know, so many of the pillars of American democracy happened through the exact amendment process I described in rooms just like this, in conversations just like this around the country where Americans thought about it, looked at the problem, decided, you know what, if we really want to protect this rare thing in human affairs ever, you know, self-government of the people, we got to step up and get an amendment done. And so we think it's our turn to do that now. We did 12 constitutional amendments in the 20th century alone. When my grandmother was born, she had no right to vote. Uh, women had no right to vote. 12 amendments in her lifetime, uh, actually. And so, you know, if, if we don't do this, we, uh, when we think we need it, but we don't do it because it's too hard, I think, I think you know, we have to ask ourselves, have, have we gotten worse than my grandmother? I don't think so, and I don't see it. When I, when I see Americans around the country, I see a, a, a determination, looking square in the eye of how big the problems are, but being willing to tackle it with big solutions like that. So where are we now? How, how are we doing? We've been at this a little bit, um, not that long, but already we have 800 cities and towns that have passed formal resolutions calling in, for support of this kind of constitutional amendment. And you can do that in Alaska communities. 800 around the country have already done it. And again, this is not partisan. It actually brings communities together as people realize, oh, that person I thought I disagreed with so much actually agrees <laughs> on this issue. It brings communities together and recommits them. Janesville, Wisconsin is a town um, in Wisconsin, of course, hometown of Paul Ryan, the last Speaker of the House. They had a resolution like this. The town got to vote. Everybody voted on it. 86% said yes. That can, that's happening around the country. 19 states have now passed formal resolutions instructing Congress to get going on this. And these states, again, all over the map in terms of what the pundits would say are, oh, that's you know, Democrat or liberal or Republican or conservative. It's states like Montana and Colorado um, 19 states have done this. And so it's actually working. It's moving 
Congress, because when they go home and they hear their citizens, their constituents, are actually talking to each other, working across partisan lines to support a big solution like this constitutional amendment to take on money in politics, they get behind it. So we now have, we're closing on 50 senators. Uh, we're closing on 200 members of the House. We gotta get to 290, we gotta get to 67. But that's what American Promise was created to help us do, to unify us together so we can get there. And so um, we have a path to victory. We backed out when we launched American Promise from what it looked like to win. Ratification of the constitutional amendment to get money out of politics, empower the citizens, empower the people, empower the states again to have fair, clean elections. What it looked like to win by July 4th, 2026, the nation's 250th anniversary of independence. And then said, what would have had to have happened? What were all the things that had to happen and how can we help them happen? And it's not about, no, we just have to get the right plan and we'll do it top down. It's all about what, whether people in the, in the country have the tools and can connect with each other and move this forward on their own. It's about empowering the people. And it's about things like being cross-partisan and focusing with a strategy and not getting distracted by all the arguments and noise that we have in our political system, but keeping the focus. And, and that's our path to victory. So we've, I've mentioned some of our advisory council. Uh, you know, we have veterans, we have faith leaders, we have business people, we have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have historians like Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, coming together to model, look, if, if Nina Turner, president of our revolution, <laughs> working with Bernie Sanders, can come together with, with Al Simpson, Republican from Wyoming, or Olympia Snow, then we can do it too. That was the idea, because it's not about the well-known people or, or the leaders, it's about us uh, in, the, in our communities. So we're vigorously cross-partisan and disciplined about that. Um, but it's up to us. Uh, we say citizen uprising, not in the sort of angry pitchfork kind of uprising, but in the rising up of our responsibilities as citizens, is our commitment of, you know, if we are citizens, if we are responsible for this republic, what would we do? Well, we do something like this. That's actually on the North Bridge, where Amer an American Promise chapter is crossing the bridge in the Patriot's Day Parade in Concord, Massachusetts. The North Bridge is where the first battle of the American Revolution took place on April 19th, 1775, and the parade goes over that. And again, the town came together to, to support this. Nobody asked, cared what anyone's politics were. It was they wanted to recommit to the principles of the American Revolution. We do this kind of thing all over the country and, and empower people to organize locally because that's how amendments actually happen. They don't come out of Washington. They don't come because Congress decided to do it. They are local and they're connected and they're community-based and then they're networked together to actually have the kind of power that can move a constitutional amendment out of Congress and through ratification. And that's a real barn raising <laughs> back in, in Concord. And Nobody knew anybody's politics, and within a day, this amazing structure had gone up. And it's an old image of American society, but it's still happening, where we can do big things if we focus on it. So we have, in these few years since we launched, just uh, three years ago, we've gone from literally a few people to 200,000 or so people in all 50 states now. Uh, people are moving these resolutions forward. They're organizing locally. They're learning. This is, believe me, it's humbling to say, okay, we're gonna do a constitutional amendment, right? But we support each other, we learn from each other. That amendment language I mentioned, it's not written in stone to say sign or don't sign. If people have ideas, that's all part of this, this work. And so it's happening around the country. We do things like the pledge campaign. We ask candidates, again, doesn't matter what party, will you pledge to support the amendment when you get elected? And they could be running for the city council. They could be running for the US Senate or anything in between, and, and um, we've asked them to pledge, and, and our members helped get 250 candidates pledged in the last election, and in 2020, we wanna do much more. I mentioned the amendment isn't written in stone, so we're doing town halls around the country. It's the first amendment in the digital age. No reason why all Americans can't be at the table about what it says or ask questions about what the words mean, anything like that. that was a, that's what we call writing the 28th amendment. We have a national conference um, we hold it in Washington because we bring people in, our members from all over the country, and after an inspiring conference, connecting with people, 
who are doing the work in other states, people they've heard about because of our national calls or our online platform. Then they work together and they go up to Capitol Hill and do a citizen lobby day and they visit with their members of Congress. And it's not a visit in a sort of protesty kind of way. We have good conversations with our members of Congress across the aisle because they're people who've come a long way to visit with them and talk about this important issue. That's how we got a cross-partisan amendment introduced this year. Uh, it wasn't because you know some lawyer made a great argument. It was because the people from the districts where those congressmen represent um, went there and asked them to do this. So it really is possible, and it's actually happening. Um, I mentioned our business councils. That's happening around the country. And then one of the things we're most excited about is the Young Americans program. Uh, that's a, another photo from another community uh, where high school students are actually leading the charge. And they're the ones who are going to live with this um, for good or ill if we're not able to solve this problem or if we are able to solve this problem. It's really whether we're going to give a chance to the next generation of Americans to tackle some of the big issues they're going to face. And one way we can help them so much uh, not with delivering the answer, because these are complicated questions and we don't know the future, but, but delivering them a system that is much better than the one that's dominated by money, that's driving people out of the system, that makes them think their vote doesn't matter, um, that's you know, squelching their voice and making solutions impossible. If we can fix the constitutional foundation, we'll have all kinds of other reforms. They'll develop their own reforms, but we'll have a strong constitutional foundation for the next generation to actually protect and advance this republic, this idea of government of the people. And so we think this will work. We're well on our way. It'll work because it's foundation principle, just like your constitution here in Alaska, our constitution nationally. I think Americans really do believe and hold in our hearts that principle that we're all created equal. We all have a right to govern ourselves together, and we respect the equal rights of our fellow Americans to do it. That's not what our politics looks like right now with the way money is used. It's not respectful of other people's rights to decide you're going <laughs> to drop in $100 million into an election or millions of dollars. That's like shouting over your fellow citizens. And most Americans, I think, want to change that. And this will give us a chance to do it. It'll be permanent in terms of fixing that foundation. Amendments are about, you know, except for prohibition, <laughs> they don't usually go backwards. Uh, they don't ever go backwards, they go forwards. And most importantly, the hardest job is done. We agree for the most part on this. Again, 80% or so of Americans think this is the right way to go. Often that's the hardest part. Should women vote? You know, That was, believe it or not, a hard debated question that was not 80% at the time. We already have the hardest thing done, the national consensus that we should do this. So now we have the opportunity to actually make it happen. So I hope you will join us at AmericanPromise.net. I hope you'll get involved. Um, we're going on to Anchorage and Fairbanks next. Uh, we really look forward to learning from Alaskans how we can help you, if this sounds of interest, uh, to do this and taking this all over the country and recommitting to the American promise of equal citizenship and self-government uh, in this republic. So thank you so much. And perhaps we can open it up to some questions. Thank you. If you have a question, please do come on up. Uh, I'll go first while people are lining up. Uh, I just got home from work. I have 20 minutes before I have to make dinner or I have to go to bed or Netflix starts. How can I, as an individual, help? Great question. First thing to do, sign up at AmericanPromise.net. That will only take a few minutes. You can sign up for our newsletter. And so the newsletter will give you the next steps and the t tools and the stories that are happening around the country so that when you have your next 20 minutes, you'll know where to go. And so there are different things you can do if you have a little more time. Um, we have actual ways of sending letters to the editor or to inform your fellow members of, of your community for contacting your legislators. But the best thing we find is, you know, this work doesn't actually do as well with 10 minutes before Netflix starts. <laughs> you know, it's actually better done in community with your friends and with your neighbors. And so that's why we form American Promise Associations. We don't actually form them. You do, people in communities. So we have dozens of 
local associations. We call American Promise Associations. And you can do what we call an inviting team. If anyone's interested in doing an American Promise Association, go to AmericanPromise.net. And when you sign up, you'll have a chance to check off how you might want to help. And if you're interested in helping to learn more about what is a local association and how you can kind of do this with your friends and others in your community, that's how you do it. And the inviting team, you learn, we have citizen empowerment coordinators who help say, okay, what's the next step? Well, you invite some friends together. We can do it by Skype. Sometimes they're potluck dinners. They're, they're actually fun. And then you go sort of through this four-part training. So you become the citizen leaders in that community who might put it on an event or might you know, have a debate or might decide to you know, work on a local resolution. Um, this is not for the kind of quick you know, internet click button that's going to get this done. This is about you deciding as a community, do we want to do this here and build this here and then connect nationally on this work? And each step of the way will take you there. So that's why I say if you only have 20 minutes, and that's how life is in kids and jobs and everything else, first go to AmericanPromise.net and sign up because you'll next have another 10 minutes or 20 minutes and you can get a little more. Um, and then trust that someone in your community is signing up and checking that box to say, I'm going to have a local American Promise Association initial meeting to decide, do we want to do this? And then you'll be on the list. We're not going to barrage you with emails, I assure you. You'll get the newsletter at most once a week. And, but that way you'll be able to be invited when one of your neighbors decides, hey, let's do this here. Sounds like an empowering process. Imagine that. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for, and American Promise for tackling this very, very difficult situation that we all find ourselves in. Uh, and I really appreciate the extent to which you're trying to make it cross-partisan, even though I suspect that on the local level in many places it's going to appear partisan. I, I, my question has to do with HR1 and um, how you see HR uh, 1 either helping to promote or not helping at all your efforts to take money out of our electoral process. Wow. Thank you. Th th thank you. Thank you so much. So HR 1 is uh, a bill that was introduced um, in the House of, in Congress. Um, the, the Democratic majority called it HR 1, meaning their first order of business. And it's a big comprehensive reform. And it has lots of interesting things, um, things about easier voting registration, um, public funding of elections uh, so that small donors and, and, and politicians and candidates could actually run without necessarily being dependent on the big donors, um, things like that. Uh, it also has um, principles about this constitutional amendment and resolves maybe we should have an amendment. Uh, those all sound good, and they are good, and there's, you, know, you can debate about the specific reforms, uh, and there will be debate about those. Um, so you know, it's helpful, clearly, that there's such energy in the country that one of the major parties thinks there's political advantage to introducing this as their number one order of business and making, making it a big issue. We're clearly gaining ground, because what they used to say is, oh, Americans actually don't care about this. You know, they don't care. Uh, they all they'll complain about the ads, but then they'll you know just do whatever they do. And you know I, I've literally heard this from politicians sometimes that you know yeah you're saying this, but actually it turns out Americans don't really care. Well, Americans do care a lot, I think, and so that's a good sign. The uh, we did not want this amendment to be in the middle of that, and and here's the reason. That's, we were very happy to have ours, which is actually the number HJ Res 2. <laughs> so it's number two, but it's House Joint Resolution 2, because we wanted it to be cross-partisan. We want, thought it's so important that this not get into a partisan dynamic. We wanted John Kako and Ted Deutsch, they were brave enough to stand up and do it together, to be able to be out of the, that HR1 process, because that's a fast train that the Democrats are pushing through. And there wasn't a lot of time for consultation with Republicans, for getting ideas from across the aisle, from sort of building that slowly. It's going through a hearing. They're going to have a vote on it. 
And it's going to be a challenge, frankly, to get it through the house. It'll pass the House with the Democrats, um, but it will run into trouble in the Senate. Senator Tom Udall will introduce it, uh, but it will run into trouble because it doesn't have the cross-partisan support. Um, so there's a plus and minus to that. We think reforms for our structure of democracy, we really need Americans to come together on this, and it's not easy, but the amendment, the constitutional amendment work can help us get there. Um, and so that's, that's why we have HJ Res 2. HJ Res 1, with these, all these reforms, again, will move forward and be some interesting ideas, but um, it's really important that the constitutional amendment be in a cross-partisan way, not just because it's a good idea, which it is, but because literally, if you want to win, you're going to need Republicans, Democrats, and independents to work together on it. So, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you. Thank you for the inspiration. Um, I'm wondering, of that vast uh, majority of conservative, liberal, and independent people who relate to the concept of what you're wanting to do with the amendment, um, what are their primary arguments for against it? Is so, it is it simply aligning with the philosophy of you know Citizens United, or is there what what really is the meat of their argument? Well, I'll start with the court because you know the members of the court are not um, you know they're very smart people and and I believe good people who are tr doing a hard hard job. So what were they thinking? What made this a good idea? Well. They are concerned um, about limits on money will suppress ideas, that if you don't have money, you can't actually have a campaign sign, let alone anything else, so that the more money that comes in, uh, the more information there will be, the more informed the voters will be, is sort of that theory, and that any effort to try to limit it will limit free speech of somebody. That's the argument, essentially. Um, and we're happy to have that argument out and debated uh, because when people hear it and think about it and see the reality of it, they respect the argument because free speech is really important. But they also know, well, we have free speech in our city council, we have free speech in our town meetings, we have free speech in our communities, but we also you know, limit ourselves so that other people can speak. You know, we'll have a two minute or five minute or whatever the time limit is. Um, you may have a parade in Juneau. It's usually not a free speech violation to say, well, get a permit because you don't want 20 parades <laughs> competing at once. Um, you don't want to have a parade through the middle of the night when people are trying to sleep. Um, so, yes, we respect free speech, but the limits also enable free speech to work because we have equal rights. And so that's the kind of debate. Is it free speech or is it not free speech? And in the Citizens United case, I'll just say a word about that, because there's an old saying among lawyers that, that hard facts make bad law, and that's a classic illustration. The hard facts of Citizens United were Citizens United is a nonprofit group that wanted to make a movie about Hillary Clinton criticizing her when she was running for office. So that sounds like classic First Amendment. You know, we want not, you know, people to be able to criticize a powerful politician who's running for office. Um, the problem is, in, in trying to answer that case, the Supreme Court just took the lid off everything. So rather than deciding, well, a nonprofit group can have that, or, you know, there's a media exception, or many ways they could have decided that case, they said no limits whatsoever on any corporation. Citizens United happened to be a nonprofit corporation, but when they decided that was free speech, they, they went out of their way to say no limits, even if it's you know, the biggest corporations in the world. Um, same thing that happened with your law in Alaska about outside money, or the law that came out of Montana about the Corrupt Practices Act limiting corporate money. Once they went down that road, they didn't know how to stop it, so they couldn't just stop it at like, you know, nonprofit groups. And so, it just became this sort of runaway train that no matter where the money comes from, and you got the super PACs and all kinds of things that the court probably didn't anticipate. The other thing they argued is, well, we can still have limits if it's a direct contribution to the candidate, and it's only the what they call independent expenditures, so i.e., the, the put it in a PAC or, or just spend the money to run TV ads. If it's not going directly to the candidate, but instead it's one of these groups 
uh, then the court said that, that's not corruption because the candidate isn't part of that, so that it isn't corrupting. And that sounds kind of right. It's sort of a, you know, that's the argument. But in the real world, what happens, none of these folks on the Supreme Court, they're very smart, not one of them has run for office. You know, Sandra Day O'Connor was the last Supreme Court justice who actually ran for anything. She was a state legislature. She knew we needed limits <laughs> and reasonable regulations because she knew how it actually worked. And so when they thought and announced, hey, independent expenditures don't corrupt, so they, we, that's why we have the super PAC. It's technically not in the campaign, but you get all the same attack ads, you get all the, it looks just like a campaign, but in theory it's not coordinated with the candidate. The problem with that, there's no limit, so that's how we got to 50 billion. That's how we got to less than 1% of the population because you know, most of us don't have millions to contribute. Um, you know, they're, one of the laws struck down what's called the aggregate limits on federal contributions. It was about $121,000. So I know so many of you were concerned that your free speech rights were violated because you had to stop at $121,000 in giving money to politicians but now you're free. So that was the argument, it's sort of free speech, but it's disconnected from the real world. And that's, that's the problem. The Supreme Court does not often overrule its own precedents, at least not directly. How do you assess the possibility that faced with, say, overwhelming public sentiment on this, the court will modify how it applies Citizens United in other cases? I very much hope they do. My um, assessment of the possibility has gone up and down <laughs> over the last few years. Um, you know, as I said, I once thought the lawyers will ride to the rescue and the judges are reasonable people and will see the light and, and, and fix it. And I actually went to Montana and helped defend that state's law uh, that I mentioned, the 1912 law about mo corporate money in politics. That case went to the Supreme Court and the court struck down the Montana law without a hearing after the Montana Supreme Court had actually upheld the law. So the state Supreme Court said, we've had this law for 100 years, just like your Judge Burgess upheld your law. They know, they're here, they know what it's like. This Montana Supreme Court upheld the law, went up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court without a hearing, one paragraph decision said, reversed the state Supreme Court and struck it down. Interestingly, four of the judges dissented and said, we shouldn't do that. We should actually take the case and reconsider what we've done exactly as you suggest. However, um, so you could say, well, hey, all we need is a fifth judge. Four of them are all ready <laughs> to do this. And uh, the reason, though, I think it's not the best strategy is because the last thing we need in this country is more toxic, partisan arguments about whether a judge should be on the court or not and another five to four decision for now going the other way isn't the permanent structural solution that an amendment is. It just delays it and there's a fight again about it and it goes back and forth. We have a chance to fix this. And so I, I assess the possibility is low considering that Montana case. There's no, they've shown no indication that they want to change this or revisit it. But I also see the wonderful possibility as you suggested, sir, that this work in the constitutional amendment might actually, the court might see that the people actually are moving this forward and they should reconsider and that can happen too. So the way I look at it, there's eight Supreme Court decisions that have been already nullified in our history by uh, constitutional amendments. You know, the Supreme Court didn't give women the vote, the Supreme Court didn't end slavery, the Supreme Court that didn't decide 18, 19, 20 year olds who are serving in the military and risking their lives ought to have the right to vote. The people did all of that. The Supreme Court decisions had gone the other way. The Supreme Court decisions decided the other way and had to be nullified. So I think that's where we are right now in our system. The court won't fix it and it's actually better that we just bite the bullet and fix it ourselves with a constitutional amendment. Great. Well. Yep. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. And, uh, that was Jeff Clements of American Promise in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation, produced in collaboration with KTOO. It was recorded March 18, 2019 at KTOO in Juno with support from AELMP, Kur Alaska Kensington Mine, Hate and Associates, Ramada by Wyndham, 
See Alaska, the University of Alaska Southeast, and Wasteman & Associates.